Well, Battleground, good morning. Happy Easter. We hope you're having a wonderful uh, day so far. Today, we're celebrating that Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. So, uh, real quick, before we even start playing, we want to invite you. There's a description right now in the top of the box that's going to send you to a link that has all the song lyrics and sermon notes for today. So, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to give you like 26 seconds to make sure you go get all the lyrics for today. So you can sing along with this. You can follow Pastor Stephen in the message, okay? So I'm going to play just for a second to give you time to find that. Uh, and then we'll get into it, okay?
shall return in robes of white. He shall return. He shall return in robes of white. you've got your Bibles or your devices with you, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And as you do, let us say, as Christians have said for years, you know, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And by God's grace, we find ourselves finishing up 1 Corinthians 15 today. And we're going to read verses 50 to 58. I would invite you, if you want to read that aloud in your homes, I would invite you to read along with me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Let's begin with prayer, and then I will read God's Word. Lord, we have gathered together all over this place and, and in, your, in your land. This is your world. And your church has gathered today despite our circumstances and the situation to worship you, to remember the, the person and the work of your son, to remember that it is finished, to remember that he is alive. And this has a radical implication for how we live. Yes, a radical implication, God, for how we live in the midst of trials. And so, Lord, I pray that you would comfort your people today. I pray that you would set us on a mission today. That you would remove the fear today. That you would remove panic and replace it with your sovereign grace. This is your word we are about to hear from, Lord. Pray that you would keep me in tension of your word. The Lord, make it clear today that we have a steadfast hope of our soul. Speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. 
when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. This is God's word. So remember, Paul has been making an argument, making his case for believers, the church, Christians, bodily resurrection. There were those that did not believe it and that were doubting it. The church was being in confusion and even in turmoil, among other things that was going on in the life of the Corinthian church. So Paul does this sort of in the life of the church now, his magnum opus on what it's going to look like when Christ returns. What has this body got to do with anything? And how do we live in light of it? And so Paul has made his case for both the facts and the evidence for the resurrection. Our resurrection is based on Christ's resurrection. We've talked about over the last couple, couple weeks the nature of this resurrected body. The nature of the resurrection itself. And now we're, today we're going to see the effects and the implication of the resurrection. Here's your main idea. If you've got your notes, I hope you have those. The main idea is a very clear one. Christians press on with steadfastness towards the coming of Jesus Christ because of this victorious resurrection. We press on. This is an important understanding. We're going to come back to this at the end. We press on with steadfastness. Paul's been making this case through this whole letter. We press on in unity and wisdom and in joy and in hope and perseverance. Christians are not saved to survive, but to live. We press on as Christians in kingdom building and family gathering, knowing that everything we do is not in vain. He's going to make that case today. So, Think about this as, as believers, why is the second coming, why is the coming of Christ such a motivation for us? We sing about it all the time. We talk about it all the time, even sometimes to the confusion of those who do not understand it. So I want us to just see a couple of simple truths today that he's making his point. He's bringing all these different arguments that he's made. He's bringing them together in this concise end to this issue of the resurrection. Think about this. There's two things I want you to see. Precisely because Christ is risen, precisely because He is alive, we are guaranteed that Christ will return. And when He does, two things we will see. We, our bodies, will be clothed for glory. And sin and death will be swallowed up in victory. The word swallow, we're going to see that in a minute. Think about this. When Christ returns, you're going to be clothed for glory. And sin and death will be engulfed by the glory of God. That's what he's saying today. And that's what we want to see first. Look at our first point. Because Christ lives, we will be clothed for glory. Now, it's been a while since we've been on a cruise. I was thinking about that. It's 25, 4 or 5 years. It was our one-year anniversary. So that'll tell you we're working on 26 this year. I think that's right. And uh, i got to look over there at my wife. One year anniversary. Here's what they told us, though. This was important because I'm a country boy at a heart and, and don't, don't really like to dress up, can't stand to wear a tie and all this kind of stuff. But when we went on there, they told us there are going to be some meals that, that's required formal attire. So that means that we could not come to certain meals on the cruise in our shorts and flip-flops. Now, it may have changed now, but we had to make sure that we had the essential attire for that event. This is the picture. As you look at verses 50 and 51, there is for eternity flesh and blood, the clothes 
workaround clothes on. This is just not suitable. It's not proper attire. Look with me in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Just look at the word, the two, the two words, flesh and blood. He's already made that case. This refers to your perishable body and mine. Our body is in a state. You're a born and you begin in a state of decay. You are headed towards death. Your body is. I know that's bad news this morning, but it's not new news for you. You may be in perfect health, but your body is a perishable body. It will decay. You will get old. Things will not work like they should. We have a perishable body. This point this body in the state of his fallenness cannot inherit the imperishable cannot stand the presence of God right now the perishable must inherit the imperishable he's already said this had not he verse 42 you can look back in your Bibles it says so it is with the resurrection of the dead what is sown is perishable but what is raised is imperishable when we talked about that last week Put a seed in the ground, and what comes up is something that is transformed. I've been keenly aware of this for the last couple of days. Been trying to get our garden planted and everything prepared, and the land. We've been, you know, tilling and planting and bending and pulling up weeds and all that kind of stuff. And my hands and my shoulders and my back has shown me that I am in a perishable body. <laughs> been hurt and been dreadful to try to keep the inflammation down. This is reality. Here's what he's saying. It cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The word cannot means you have no ability. It is not suitable. Was suitable, wasn't it? You remember? There was a time in the beginning where God created a place, and God and man lived in that place in peace and unity, but sin broke fellowship, and, I, and death became as a result of sin. Now we inherit a perishable body. We need transformation. Talked about that last week. He's returned to it. There has to be something changed for us to inherit the imperishable. The question that some of the people were asking in the church was, well, you're saying that people who die ahead of us, that their body will be resurrected. What about us? What if we're alive when Jesus comes back? I mean... We're just going to go straight there. What Almost they were of anxiety wondering about this. And so he makes it clear. Whether you are alive or whether you have died, you need transformation. Your bodies must be changed in order to what he calls inherit the kingdom of God. This is Paul's summation of God's people inheriting every one of the promises that he has promised his people. A place of absolute rule of God's kingdom, peace, and righteousness. It's what we look forward to. That's what we are not experiencing right now in this broken world. Radical transformation. And this is an instantaneous clothing. Look at verses 51 and 52 together. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment. So this is how we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Now, a mystery, verse 51, is something that you cannot know unless it's revealed to you. Most of, many of you like to watch mystery kind of movies. I like that myself. The mystery is trying to be solved, but it cannot be solved unless something is revealed. He's saying this mystery of how this transformation is going to happen has been revealed and he's telling us now it's going to happen in a moment that's a period of time that cannot be divided again it's that quick he and just to make sure he understands it he he says it's a blink it's it's the time it takes you for to blink your eyes when christ returns that's how quickly you will be transformed you know you would learn more about how the first creation started if we think about how what's going to change at a moment Christ makes our bodies whether you are dead and decayed or whether you're alive brand new that quick in a moment so why does he use this terminology trumpet 
Well, the, the trumpet is something that if you were in a, in a king and you had a king that was over us now, would make perfectly clear. Sometimes you can even see this. You look in England and how they how they train queen over there. The trumpet announced the arrival of the king. And in the Old Testament, sometimes the trumpet is a sign of what they, we call the day of the Lord. That day where, where, where God deals with the evil and brings his people to a place of peace and rest. This is, what's, this, is the use, this is the imagery when Christ returns. The king has come and we will be changed. Yeah, I know if you like to talk, think about the end times or anything, 1 Thessalonians is a, is a book that you probably love. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 Paul uses nearly the, the exact same language to describe the coming of Christ. For the Lord himself, verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So notice that the coming of Christ is a public coming. It is a visible coming. It is an unmistakable coming. And at that public, visible coming, we will be instantly changed. He uses this word, a cry, a voice, a trumpet. I love verse 54. It's the picture that I wanted you to see of that you must be clothed for glory. Verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass what is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see that word put on? It's the word clothed. We have to have something put on. We said this last week, didn't we? We have to be fit for glory. Christ, life, death, and his resurrection. We have a glorified body fit for us, waiting for us. And when he comes, we will get that. We will inherit that in the kingdom with it. So back to the cruise. I had to pack my own clothing for the formal. My wife had to pick that out for us. Put it in the suitcase. You can't do that for eternity. There's nothing in this life that you can put in your suitcase that you can put on in eternity. It must be given to you. You must be clothed by God for God. And let that reorient us this morning. As the American dream seems a little bit less important to us today than it did a month ago. We must be clothed for glory. And because Christ is risen, we will be. This is good news today. Because Christ lives, Christ will return. And the dead will rise. And we will be clothed for glory. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. I want us to grab this other same thing I want us to see. Not only will we be clothed for glory, but God's going to deal with sin and death. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, Christ, himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one that has the power of death, that is, the devil. So because Christ lives, sin and death will be swallowed up by victory. Look with me at verses 54 and 55. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the sayings that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death! Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? So I want you to see something here in verse 54. You see death is swallowed up in victory? That word swallowed up could mean the word engulfed. And victory is the same word for glory. So you could literally say death is engulfed, engulfed by glory. So there is a battle, a contest, you see. The power of sin and death. We see war going on today. The power of the risen Lord. 
This is the stage for all of history. Have you ever seen a forest fire? This is the picture I have. It's a negative example, but it's a clear one. You ever seen a forest fire out west? What happens when the forest is engulfed by fire? I saw a picture this week. And they sent it to some of the guys of these firemen looking on as in the backdrop you see all of these forests. And in a moment, the wind grabs this far and everything is engulfed and you cannot stop it. This is the picture of the coming of Christ. His holiness will engulf all creation and those that are not clothed with power on high will be taken are you clothed for glory? Jesus ascended. He told the disciples to wait until they received a clothing, power from on high. The glory of God will engulf. It will swallow all of creation. And Paul's response, because Christ is alive, is to taunt death. That's what he's doing. You see that? Verse 55. He's taunting death. He's talking directly to death. He's saying, death, what you got? Jesus is alive. He lived a perfect life because we couldn't. He died in our place. And he rose again. He's saying, because he's alive, what you got, death? What can you bring to me? I have a clothing waiting. I have a body waiting. He, he quotes here the Old Testament. Isaiah 25 and Hosea 13. and You see, Isaiah 25, the prophet is talking about a day of the Lord when God will judge the wicked and he will set a table before his people. All of God's people long for that day. And he's saying the day is coming. And because Christ is alive, it's guaranteed. In the present tense, Though the future is not yet here yet, is it? We're not living in heaven. We haven't received the imperishable bodies yet. Paul speaks of it as if he already has because, see, the work is finished because Christ is alive. You see, when sin is defeated, the death, sting's death is removed. You see, today, we're worried far too much about death and not near enough about sin. Death came from sin, brothers and sisters. Verse 56 and 57, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. To God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you remember? Death comes by sin, Romans 5, 12. Sin gives us death and introduced all of the terrors and all of the misery that we have seen and do see in this life. And if sin is swallowed up, if, if there, listen today, whether you are a believer or not, the most important question in the world is, did Jesus Christ raise from the dead? Because if he did, then he has dealt with the sin problem, and he is the only one that has. And if he has, death is harmless. It is a snake that has been defamed. John Piper, I think, call, calls Satan a snake whose head has been cut off. And though he's flailing around and he's still got some danger, he has been defamed. It's true. So look at verse 56. Why did he bring up the law? Well, you see, the law didn't bring us salvation. The only thing the law did is show us how bad our sin is. But it gave us no answer. Salvation is a gift from God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he's brought to praise now. As he said, praise God. Be thankful to Jesus Christ because he has given us the victory. He absorbed in his body the sting of death. And he and his body dealt with the problem of sin. And because he has, listen, we do not deny death. We do not trivialize death right now. That's why I'm looking at you through a camera. We take 
these things serious. But listen today, if you have fell into a state of fear and panic today, we need to remember that Jesus Christ is alive and our glorified bodies are secure. Our destination is eternal and it cannot be removed because Jesus is alive. We need not fear death. We do not deny it. We do not trivialize it, but we need not feel, fear it. Christ has conquered. His people are redeemed. Death is disarmed. The grave is no more, and we are with our Lord. That's our future. I usually say, so what, right about now? I got so then. So then, Jesus is risen. How should we respond? We are not with him yet. He has not come back yet. Three responses I want you to see. Three responses because Christ is risen. First, hope is obvious. It's just thanksgiving. Thanks be to God. That's what verse 57 says. Look at it. And because Christ is risen, thanks be to God because He has given us the victory. Victory has come because He is raised. Listen, if Jesus lived a good life and He died, there is no victory. He's, he's victorious precisely because He is risen. And this changes everything. And so I want you to think about this this morning. Hands are cold a little bit. almost crossed my arms. And well, think about this this morning. You may not be aware of this because we don't know history all the time. In ancient Rome, after a great victory, the, the, the warriors, the soldiers would come home. They would march in triumphal procession into the city. And as they did, the people would have this, these incense and this aroma and there would be a great celebration because they have won a great victory. They have brought honor and glory to the kingdom of Rome. So I want you to see something. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, Paul's the letter that's right next to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want you to see this, what Thanksgiving looks like. Thanksgiving is not passive. Listen to this. Think about the list of the victorious soldiers walking triumphantly in. Listen to what he says. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Verse 15. For we are the aroma of Christ to God. Amongst those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance of life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Paul sees all of life as the body of Christ, as a triumphal procession into the very presence of his Lord. We will be fit for God's presence once more. And here's what Paul is saying. You are here today. You are still alive today because we are on a procession. We are headed somewhere. Our future is secure because Christ is alive. And what we are doing right now is, is bringing people along in the procession. Look at verse 58. Paul summarizes the resurrected life, the implication of your life because Jesus is risen today on Easter. In verse 58, look at it. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We're going to talk about this again next week as we end Paul's letter to, to the Corinthians. You see this word here, steadfast. He's got in mind when he says this, and he's going to return to it in chapter 16. We should be steadfast in the faith. We have said very clearly today, brothers and sisters, there's 
There's a lot of conversation about your personal faith and not near enough on the faith. Our personal faith only means anything because it is rooted in something that is immovable. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is his gospel. And there is no other hope in anything else. So we need to know the faith. We need to stand for the faith. We need to live the faith. And we should enjoy the faith. But he's got something else in mind too. Look at verse 58. We should, because our is secure, because Christ is alive, we should give ourselves to the work. Do you see that? There's two results of this life. We see it in this text. Steadfastness and an abounding. We're not supposed to just survive today. God calls us to the work. This work is the mission. And it's ministry. This is what we say in the church. Where are you ministering? To whom are you ministering? And who are you gathering today? We've had these little baby chicks for the last week. We've got some chicks. We're going to raise some chickens, and they're little tiny right now. Right now, I wonder if you see those outside of Christ as those little chicks. You see, they don't have a mommy anymore. We had to put them in an incubator. We had to put a heat lamp on them. We have to feed them. We have to clothe them. We have to, we have to protect them. We have to make sure they grow. This is what God has given us. This, brothers and sisters, is the work. So, I know you as I have more than likely, to some degree, fell into survival mode during these last few weeks. So, because I love you and because God did this to me, can I orient your perspective this morning? A friend sent me a sermon and I listened to it and gave me a website on there. It got, my, got me curious. It's Saturday morning and I'm working on the message and I pull up this website and it, it tracks statistically all over the world those that are being born and those that are dying and all this other information. But that was what I was concerned myself with. And I was astounded when I looked at these numbers. The numbers are live. They're moving all the time on the screen. I went down to the abortions that have happened this year. It's April. This year, in this world... 9.30 Saturday morning, it was 11,802,052 babies that have perished this year in this world. Let that sink in. I closed my computer and I went, out to, went off to my day. 6.30, I opened up my computer to work on the message and I still had that screen minimized. And you know what it said? 11,846,315. Nine hours while I worked in my garden, 40 to 44,263 babies were murdered. And Sunday morning, when I got up and started my sermon preparation, the number was 11,906,335. 104,000 babies died in 24 hours while we slept. And so, brothers, can I tell you this? You say, what's your point? There's work to be done, brothers and sisters. The problem is not death. The problem is sin. And so today, could we that are still here not merely survive. Because Christ is risen. He has called us to a work. He has called us to gather, to protect, and to defend. Brothers and sisters, we are the church. We are the aroma of Christ given as a gift to a world that is broken. Will we be that gift? Our destiny is secure. We will be clothed for glory. Sin and death will not have the final say on your life or mine. But Christ has put us on a procession toward a destination. And he has told us to gather people, gather his church, and build up his church. 
You are the dwelling place of God today on this earth. There is no building. Haven't we learned that? We don't need a building. I'm at a farm today. I don't, we don't need a building. God does not dwell in a building. He dwells in you. He dwells in us. Let us today, with our resurrected hope, because we have a resurrected Savior, get to the work today, brothers and sisters. Because glory is before us, and so is the work. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we have heard from your word today, this resurrection morning, as we remember that your son is alive, and you have given us an assurity of our salvation, a clothing. Now with the Holy Spirit, but then we will see you face to face. New creation made, new bodies given, made without sin. Oh God, we long for that day. But Lord, there are brokenness all around us. There are the marginalized who will get no press time as they perish in silences, as they hunger in silence, as they put these death camps in the marginalized of society. Lord, may we rise up and not be okay with it because you have given us work to do. And so now, Lord, we long to, from our homes, and where we are now, worship our Lord, for He is risen. And so, Lord, now, accept our worship as a pleasing sacrifice to You, for You are our strength and our Redeemer. And it is our Lord's name we pray. Amen.
y'all so much first off just for joining us for easter um it's also a little bit different just thinking I'm, i normally get like a new shirt for easter or something and uh, i'm really quickly learning how much stuff doesn't matter like like i thought it would and mm-hmm. uh, just so thankful that we get to worship together today um, and so we just want to spend our last few moments just to praying together and um i do want to put to your attention again if you look into the description Outside of just the link that takes you to the notes and music for the day, there's also a link right under it that says that um, it's for Andy Armstrong and also our ties for our normal week. Um, and I'm going to encourage you, you can click there and give right at this very moment, or you can wait and you can send um, your money to the church for Andy Armstrong and or tithes and offering. Um, so we just want to pray towards that end. Um, what we just sung, oh, we're free, forever we're free. Come join the song, the song of the redeemed. That's our song, church, and that's what we're doing when we're helping and supporting our North American Mission Board. Um, so I'm going to encourage you from that end today. Um, so let's just, let's pray, and then I'm going to read this passage of scripture over you and your family. Father, I thank you that this morning the gospel cannot be stopped. Thank you that those sickness and fears all around us, Lord, we thank you that you have won the victory through the resurrection, Lord Jesus. And today, most ever the more in that victory. And Father, we cannot wait to the day when we get to see you face to face. Lord, until that day, well, may we not be quiet with the gospel. 
And may we not be quiet with the mission. Continue forever and evermore declaring to other people, come, come join the song of the redeemed. Come to the table. So Father, we do pray. We pray for not only ministry here at Battleground, ministry throughout churches around our area. We pray for North American missions this morning. Lord, there's incredible work that you're doing right in this country, right in our continent, Lord. And we thank you for that. We pray that you'll continue to spread your name, your fame to the ends of this nation, oh God. We need a revival, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you do a work even at this moment? And Father, burden our hearts this morning to give sacrificially for the sake of your mission on North America. Lord, bless our tithes, bless our offerings. I pray you were honored and worshiped this morning. We thank you again for the opportunity to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as we close, I um, just want to read 1 Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 23, over you and your family today. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, church. He will surely do it. God bless. Happy Easter. We cannot wait to see you next week.